Good morning, everybody. The chatter sounds wonderful. We'll continue that at about 11.05 when Wayne's done. So, <laughs> right now, we're going to worship our Lord and Savior, and we're going to start with singing 431, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the wolf beside the sea. Be on the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord, my spirit pass for thee, O living word. Thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me, as thou didst bless the bread by Galilee, then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all in all. Good morning, everybody. And those on the uh, Facebook or video or whatever, uh, good morning to you as well. And it is so good. I love to do this, to, uh, to, to encourage myself and to encourage you. Uh, it is so good to come together, to assemble, but more importantly, to hear the word of God. And I noticed from the scriptures, the Bible talks about, like Paul and Peter, they will say, I'd like to remind you, I'd like to remind you, we all should be reminded of the word of God. This morning, all of us, we have a choice. And that's very powerful. We make a choice. We can make choices. We choose to come here. Nobody forces. We choose to come here. So you can choose to do something. You can choose to act. You can choose to think. And I like to focus on the thinking part. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the scripture encourages us to think right. In uh, Proverbs chapter 23, 23 verse 7. I like the King James Version. It says that whatever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's the same as saying that you are what you think. If you think wrong, your life will be wrong. And also, it says in Proverbs chapter 23, uh, Chapter, chapter 4, verse 23. Watch your heart with all diligence. The word diligence says that uh, work at it. Train it. Practice it. Watch your hearts with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. So if your heart is not right, the issues of life, your behavior, your actions will not be right. And then in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul by the same principle, encourage us. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. It's very hard to rejoice when our mind is filled with things that are not rejoicing. So Paul encourages us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Say, whatever that is, whatever that is true, Whatever that is honorable, whatever that is right, whatever that is pure, whatever that is lovely, whatever that is of good repute, commendable, something good. 
If there's anything that is of excellence and worthy of praise, put your mind on those things. That's very powerful. That's very powerful. And the next verse, the Apostle Paul says, put that into practice. Become a habit of the mind. Very, very powerful stuff. That's why we come to church, be reminded of the power of the Word of God that can change our life, change our day, change our week, change our, change our time. Amazing. This morning I had uh, a few announcements to make. This is from Matt uh, uh, Carden. Uh, VBS needs volunteers. Sign up on the bulletin board by the nursery. And then also, we must not forget, we have a, a brother in Christ added to our family, and this is Lindo Ramirez, who was baptized last Friday, and uh, he's a good friend of uh, Diana Trailer. And I have another announcement. Uh, Cheyenne Smith, niece of uh, Crystal DeWin, was in a serious car crash yesterday, and is going in for her second surgery at noon. Uh, pray with us, please. Let's bow our head together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we come together to uh, worship you. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you for your word, which is so powerful. We just pray that you help us to put that into our heart, in our mind, in our spirit, that we may dwell on things that are pleasing to you. Lord, at this time, we want to uh, pray for Shayan Smith. We pray, Lord, that you please uh, be with her. Uh, be with the doctors, the nurses, the specialists who are attending to her. And we just pray, Father, that all the specialists, when they treat her, that this treatment is totally blessed by you and help her to a good and complete and speedy recovery. Also, at this time, I want to pray for Lindo. We pray, Father, that you help us all to encourage him, that he will continue to grow uh, uh, in the Lord, and that uh, we are so happy, Father, that he's added uh, to your family. And we want to pray also, Father, for the uh, VBS. We pray, Lord, that there will be uh, volunteers. Many of us will step up to that, and that uh, we will uh, use this opportunity such a good opportunity to, uh, to encourage the young ones that they may know you when they're young and in their youth, in their teens. Lord, we thank you for all these opportunities and we thank you for this time. Please forgive us for our sins and help us truly to worship you in, in spirit and in truth. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone Forgiveness here, we in turn forgive all wrong. Come tell us here, he breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is head. No unseen, he meets us here in the breaking of the bread. We'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll sing the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we and
this a day, the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. When I survey the wondrous cross, on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss, and for contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow Good morning, family. So good to see everyone out here and our numbers up again. It's just, uh, it's encouraging. <laughs> as we get ready this morning, as we gather and prepare to join together in breaking bread and drinking the cup, our thoughts should focus on Jesus, his life, relationships, and examples teach us how we should try to live our lives. His compassion makes us feel loved. When he picked ordinary people with flaws to be his inner circle, it gives us hope and confidence that we can be included in his family. By Jesus becoming man, and experiencing the world, we have something that we can go to, we have someone we can go to in prayer, and we know that he understands anything we are facing. We see the human parts of Jesus when we see him in the garden, alone facing the coming death on the cross. In Luke 22, verses 41 through 44, it states, he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. But we are filled with joy and excitement when we hear of his victory over death and the risen Christ. We now share in his glory. In Romans 8, 17 states, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Now we are here together to share these emblems of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. He is our savior, our path to the promises of heaven and eternal life as part of his family. Let us meditate on these things as we share in this communion. Let us pray. Lord, you lived here on earth with us and gave us 
a perfect example to follow. Help us as we stumble daily to continue to strive to make ourselves more like you each day. And never forget the gift of salvation you made possible for all that will accept your grace and love. May we remember the victory you won for us on the cross as we share this bread together. Help us to be always aware of that sacrifice each day. Let's pray again. Lord, your love for us, for us is amazing. We do not deserve the gifts you place before us, but by your act of obedience to the Father and that love, we are made sinless in the sight of God. How great is your power and how wonderful your love. We take this cup and remember that day the stone was rolled away and you were raised in glory. You conquered death. Each of us have a home in heaven already prepared because of that. Praise you above all else. Amen. As we think of giving, we have just spoke of the greatest gift God has given us. And all other gifts seem small when compared to that one. But when you look at all the additional blessings that rain down on us continually, it humbles us. If each of us take just a look around and see how God blesses our personal life, by giving us strength through difficult times, courage to fa face scary situations, toughness to let insults roll off of us, and a forgiving heart so we can be compassionate and loving to each other. He is always there beside us, helping us through the painful parts of our journey. He also gives us beauty the world around us, the smell of the earth after a rain, the vibrant colors of a sunset, the sounds of birds singing in the morning, the laughter of a child playing. We have a loving Father that sees to all of our needs. Help us give back to that loving Father and be thankful. Let's pray. Lord, you bless us with so much. Help us cheerfully give from our hearts and continue to thank you for all you do in our lives. As we started again last week, we're going to do our Bible hour again today. If you'd like to send your children, let's stand and sing Jesus Loves the Little Children as they go. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red or yellow, black or white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. 
Jesus died for all the children, all the children of the world. Red or yellow, black or white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus died for all the children of the world. Autumn told us we had 17 of those little guys in that class last week. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Before Wayne's lesson, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Oh, will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with the load of care? Pray Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee, thou wilt find a solace there. Please be seated. Good morning. We'll be reading from Psalms 23. May look a little bit familiar. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lay down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me to the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Though for out with me, Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine's enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We've got a lot to be celebrating, a lot to be thankful for. Now, Brother Qual mentioned just a few minutes ago about uh, our new brother in Christ, Lindo Ramirez. And so I want to make sure that uh, we as Eastwood welcome him as a family member. Lindo, could you wave your hand just so that people know where you are? So he put on, let's, let's thank the Lord for that. Yeah, God bless you. God bless you. Children really say some of the craziest things at times, don't they? Even about serious subjects, even something as serious as death. I came across a, a, a good housekeeping um, article, and here were some quotes that some young people had to say about death. Young Alan was only seven years old, and he said, God doesn't tell you when you're going to die because he wants it to be a big surprise. Seven years old. <laughs> Stephanie, she was nine years old, and she says, Doctors help you so you won't die until you pay all the bills. I think she's got something figured out there. Or Marcia, she was nine, and says, when you die, you don't have to do homework in heaven unless your teacher is there also. So I, what's this, what's this say about some of our teachers? 
Ralph, he was 10 years old. Now, I love this. He was very courageous and courteous. He said, I'm not afraid to die because I am a Boy Scout. And so uh, Malachi, that ought to warm your heart. He was a Boy Scout. He wasn't afraid to die. We come to the very final statement of Jesus that he made from the cross. As I've reiterated several times throughout this series, imagine how difficult every, every phrase, every statement that he would have to make. And they were so very vitally important, not only to that first century audience that heard him for the first time, but so much even for us 2,000 years later to build our faith, our devotion, our trust in Jesus Christ. Again, seven statements from the cross, three that he made to us, his heavenly Father. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. My, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Three out of the seven directly to his heavenly Father. But three were to the audience that was around there at the cross. To Mary, his mother, dear woman, here is your son. Here is your mother, that he said to that beloved disciple. To the criminal that was on the cross that recanted his uh, position of where he was making fun of and mocking Jesus and Today, you know, would you remember me when I come in, when you come into your kingdom? Jesus would say today, you will be with me in paradise. To all the soldiers and those that were around him, he would say, I thirst. And then lastly, one more, could either be reference to his father or also to those that are around him at the cross. It is finished. It is finished. Seven statements from the cross. For those of you that have spent time studying God's word, you know that the number seven is kind of a special number, don't you? It is a number of completion. It is a number of perfection, but perhaps we may have forgotten that it is also a number of rest. Do you remember all the way back to the creation account recorded in the book of Genesis? In Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, notice what it says again. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all of the work of creating that he had done. So that seventh day was a day of rest. Jesus had made six statements on the cross that we've studied so far. And now we come to that final statement of Jesus. And so after he says this, his physical body can now have a rest. So if you will go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 23, we will look at that final statement of Jesus from the cross. Luke chapter 23, and we're going to be reading verse 44 through 46. Let's go ahead and advance that slide, if you will, gentlemen. I'm going to begin reading in verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour. Darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. For the sun had stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The final words of Jesus from the cross. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, if you notice at the bottom of that slide, there's a reference to Psalm chapter 31. I'd like for us to turn there because just like many of the statements that Jesus made on the cross, many of them came directly out of the Old Testament. So if you'll turn with me to Psalm chapter 31, I'd like to read the first five verses there. Here's what the word of God says in Psalm chapter 31, beginning in verse 5. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Free me from the trap that is set for me. For you are my refuge. And look at verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Look at that beautiful prayer, that beautiful request that the Lord had made. He started praying to his father, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. 
And now as he comes to that seventh and final statement, he goes back to his father in prayer, in this trusting prayer. Maybe when uh, you were small or when your children were little, you had a little bit of a bedtime routine. I know when our children were, were, were growing up, one thing that we liked to do with them was to have some time of Bible reading. And then we'd have a little time of prayer and maybe talk and visit a little bit. It was a wonderful routine. God really blessed our family with doing that. I remember growing up as a youngster, and my mother would have a prayer that she would have me to say. And it kind of went something like this. You're probably very familiar with it. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. But if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now it's interesting, New Testament commentator William Barclay will say about Psalm chapter 31 that this prayer, thought into your hands I commit my spirit, was something that a Jewish mother would teach her children. Think of that trusting prayer for that child to think about putting their spirit into the, the hands of the father. And now Jesus even adds an extra word on there, father. Oh, haven't we seen this a thousand times where a father's carrying around his son or his daughter and they're tired and they're wore out and they fall asleep on their father's shoulder. To think about one's life as it comes to the end of its physical life, that we are just like a child falling asleep into the arms of a loving and caring and tender father. Now Jesus used that term father many times throughout the course of his physical life. You recall back when he was just 12 years old, he was puzzled that, uh, that his mother and Joseph had been searching so diligently for him and knowing, not knowing where he would be. He said, didn't you know that I needed to be in my father's house? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will use the term father 17 times. 17 times in those three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus cleared the temple telling others, stop turning my father's house into a market. And he comforted his disciples, telling them, my father's house has many rooms, or some of your older versions, many mansions. Now he begins to lay down his physical life, father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. What a comfort to know that Jesus' Father is our Father as well. Don't we pray as Jesus instructed in that Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We have a Father that loves us, that cares for us. We read in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God and that is what we are. One of the great promises of scripture is God's abiding faithful presence. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And then from the 23rd Psalm, Mike did a wonderful job as he's reading that to us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will, um, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Death can come very unexpectedly in life. I want you to be praying for a family for me here this day and the days going forward. Rob and Sarah Traverner. Many of you know Rob and Sarah. They live up here in Chase, Kansas. Rob has taught school for many years. He also is the preacher there in Lyons at the Lyons Church of Christ. They, they have been blessed with seven children and their oldest son, Tom, 33 years old, passed away unexpectedly this last week. They'll be having his funeral service this afternoon in Wichita at the Emporia Avenue Church of Christ. Death can come so very unexpected to us. I read somewhere not too long ago that there's a th 100 automobile deaths every day here in America. We had mentioned just a, a few moments ago at the beginning of the service that uh, our niece, Cheyenne Smith, was in a very, very serious automobile accident. She was driving home, hydroplaned her car, flipped her car, was in a, a ditch. She had compound fractures in her leg. Her hip socket has been obliterated. Lots of lacerations all over. She's had one surgery late last night. She will be having another one here at about noon. So life can change so quickly and so drastically. Therefore, we need to be prepared, need to be prepared. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That ought to be something that we're praying when we're going through those dark times, those difficult times in life. 
at this time that we are facing our mortality, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Jesus faced death victoriously. How was he able to do that? How was he able to be so confident and victorious in his death? Someone has said, you are not prepared to live until you are prepared to die. Again, death is inevitable for all of us. Every one of us, our days are numbered. Some people have very short numbering in this life. Others have many days that they've been blessed with. They may live to be 100 years old. But all of us, our days are numbered. Now, we as Christians can face death with great confidence, great joy, great expectancy. The Apostle Paul, when he found himself in a situation he was not quite sure whether or not he would live through it, he'd write to the Christians in Philippi. He would say, to live is Christ and to die. Think about this. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Physical life is good. The life to come for the Christian is gain. It's an, ad, uh, it's an advantage for us. It's much better. We desire to part and be with Christ, which is better by far. Allow those words of scripture to be written on your mind and your heart. To die with Christ is better by far. And so Jesus in that final statement teaches us how to face death with satisfaction. Let's see. Let me move this slide here just a little bit. Advance that one more, gentlemen. As Jesus was drawing his life to a close, he would say this statement. We focused on it uh, one week. It is finished. To tell us die, paid in full, just like a son that was given a mission by a father to go do a work. So Jesus fulfilled perfectly the mission that God had sent him on. He fulfilled all the prophecies that we read about in Scripture. He was that sin bearer. He paid that price of atonement, that alonement, where humanity and God could be put back together again in a right relationship. And so he could look back over the course of his physical life with satisfaction. I've done it all. I've completed. I have finished the work. When we're able to look back over the course of our life, are you able to look back with satisfaction? Or do you look back over your life with regret. Oh, I hope we're not like these two gentlemen. We've known folks like that living in the community. They were the people that were very, very difficult for their neighbors. They're the ones that were a, a thorn in the flesh for law enforcement because they were breaking the law. They were absolute hellions in life. One of the brothers dies. They have to find somebody to do the funeral service for him. So the brother goes to the local gospel preacher and says, I will make a generous contribution to your building project that's going on at your church, if you use this statement in your sermon, that my brother was a saint. The preacher agrees to do that. Now his wife wonders how he as a person of integrity is going to say that this man was a saint. And I mean that gospel preacher said it as it was. He did not pull any punches at the lifestyle that these men had lived. They were fighters. They they were drunkards. They, they were very immoral. They were just trouble all around. So she thought, how is he, he going to use this word? He was a saint. And so as he closed up his remarks over the eulogy, he said this. There is no question that this man was a friend of the devil. But when compared to his brother, he was a saint. So he was able to work it in there. <laughs> to be sure, just to be honest. All of us are going to have some regret in life. As we look back to say, I wish I'd have done this. I wish I'd taken advantage of this. I wish I wouldn't have said this. We're going to have some regrets, no doubt. But I absolutely believe if we will seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be given unto us. As we live a faith-filled and faithful life, we can look back with satisfaction Lord, I have done what you put me on this earth to do. Satisfaction. But I think Jesus also looked forward to the, the future with joy. Go with me to this familiar passage found in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, and look at the satisfaction, the joy the Lord had. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, he's summarizing up, uh, summarizing up chapter 11, that great chapter of faith. 
He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And here's what I'd like to emphasize. Who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, Jesus knew there was a great joy that awaited him. After he had blessed his apostles there uh, near the area of Bethany, as he departed back up into the clouds, he would go all the way back to be with his heavenly father, and he'd sit down at the right hand of the heavenly father. There was such joy. There was exaltation. Paul writing to the Philippians says in chapter 2 and verse 9, God exalted him to the highest place, and having his, the name above every name, what a joy that must have been for Jesus. In much the same way, we as Christians should have great joy as we think about our heavenly reward. I'd like for you to turn with me to the first chapter of the book of 1 Peter. Let's read just about six verses there. 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 9. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Peter records this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, and it's kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation, the deliverance, the rescuing, of your souls. The following inscription was found on a tombstone. Remember, friends, when passing by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare for death and follow me. Somebody inscribed just below that fancy stamped inscription. To follow you, I am not content until I know which way you went. So, we know which way that Jesus went, don't we? We know that he went right back to his heavenly Father. And we can have that same inexpressible joy and confidence looking forward to our, day, our ending days in this physical life to go to a place which is much, much better. As we review now, these seven statements of Jesus on the cross. I believe they give us so much good education. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Each and every day they have opportunity to be bumped and bruised by those that are around us. What a great prayer to be able to pray. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We can learn the lesson today. You will be with me in paradise. Jesus is all about seeking souls. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. He was so concerned about souls, even as he was God. He was concerned about those that could come to be with him in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. He was concerned about his family. Dear woman, I'm getting some directions to move over a little bit. Dear woman, here is your son. Here is your mother. Isn't that an important reminder for us to make family a priority? Be sure that we're taking care of our loved ones. Well, we can also learn an important lesson. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken by his heavenly Father for a period of time so that you and I would not be forsaken. I thirst. That reminds me of the humanity of Jesus, that he, he can have empathy. He can have sympathy for us and give us grace in our time of need. It is finished. He completed his work. It gives us a goal, an aspiration. Lord, I want to complete the work that you've put me on this earth to complete. And then finally, when it comes to the end of our life, 
to be able to say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So I want to ask you this morning, have you committed your spirit into the hands of God? Have you come to the point of life? Where Paul, writing to the Romans, said, Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Have you come to the point of your life when you realize, just like he, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse number 5, that I can do nothing apart from him, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4 and verse 13. Oh, when we come to the end of our life, it not, not to be full of fear and nervousness and upsetness and trying to cling on to the very last breath that we take, but we're learning an example from Jesus, Father, when this time comes into your hands, I commit my spirit. Are you prepared? Have you obeyed the gospel like uh, our new brother Lindo had this past Friday? Angels in heaven rejoicing, having the forgiveness of sins, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, getting ourselves in a position that we who believe in the name of the Son of God can know that we have eternal life. If we can help you or serve you in any way, won't you come as we stand and sing this invitation song? Days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today, leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, 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 burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. At this time we'll have our closing prayer, but stay put because we'll have another song following. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this time we've been able to share with each other, be here and listen to your word and be encouraged. We're just so blessed to see friends and, and loved ones here and new members to the body. We're just so thankful, Father, that you allow us this time to come together to rejuvenate and to be re-energized. We ask that as we leave this place and go our separate ways, you help us to strive to stay energized and to help each other when we're able to, to offer that helping hand and just encourage each other. We thank you, Father, for your love for us, and we thank you for your son that he was willing to die on the cross. Just pray and ask, Father, that as we leave, we be mindful and be in prayer and help us to be true to you. Pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name.
I was reminded that last week I forgot to tell you to go pick up your children if they were down in the Bible hour. <laughs> so if they've been down there for a week, you can go down and get them now. <laughs> well, we sing 778. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without Thee. I cannot try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the load of life unaided. I need Thy strength to lean myself upon. Be with me, Lord, and then if danger threatens, if storms of trial burst above my head, if lashing seas leap everywhere about me, they cannot harm or make my heart afraid. Be with me, Lord, when loneliness overtakes me, when I must weep amid the fires of pain, and when shall come the hour of my departure, for worlds unknown, O oh Lord, be with me then. You're dismissed. Myself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord.